I had several dental practices and it was very difficult at one point. I had nearly kind of a physical and emotional breakdown because I was working myself so hard, didn't structure things correctly. I didn't have an executive team. I didn't have anything like systems or anything like that. Sold a handful of those practices, used the two remaining practices as my lab to, to try to do it the right way. And then started teaching people about um, multiple practice ownership and setting your practice up the right way, leadership and those sorts of things. In life in general, if you feel any arrogance or cockiness about your standing in life, your, your rooms that you're hanging out in are way too small. That pressure that we put on ourselves as entrepreneurs and humans is really, really important to, to personal development and growth. I mean, it's all about the journey. It's all about the setbacks. It's all about the struggles, taking a hard look in the mirror and saying, this is a gut check time. This is a trajectory moment. I can go one way or the other. Those are what makes the richness of life. And I think that that's what develops us as humans. Good day, everyone. This is Dr. David Phelps of the Freedom Founders Mastermind Community and the Dentist Freedom Blueprint Podcast. I'm looking forward to a conversation with a longtime friend, colleague, mentor, influencer in the industry, Dr. Mark Costas. Mark, thanks for coming on today. Thank you so much for for having me on, David. This is such a treat. Well, I love our conversations and I just want to make sure that people are on the same page. A lot of people know who you are, have some idea, but it's always good to just uh, refresh and kind of give a, a background because we'll use that background and some of your story to dig into what you're doing today and, and, and how you're helping our colleagues in, in dentistry. Uh, sure. Dr. Mark Costas is far from a typical dentist and a dental coach. During his career, he has been able to start or acquire over a dozen successful dental practices during some of the profession's most challenging times. Dr. Costas' journey was not without setbacks. In fact, he credits much of his success to the fact that he made more mistakes in his first year of private practice ownership than most dentists make in an entire career. Well, if you actually documented that, sir, uh, that, that, that's, that's saying a lot, but I know we, I know we all have gone through those challenging early years, uh, but, yeah. but you're right, um, the lessons we learned. What separated him from the masses, however, was the fact that he viewed each failure each, and each roadblock as a learning experience and an opportunity to improve his business and his life. This philosophy, as well as his decision to model the world's most successful entrepreneurs and dentists, has led him to where he is today. Dr. Costas is an international keynote speaker and the founder of the Dental Success Institute, a company committed to helping dentists to achieve their full potential while recapturing their passion for dentistry. He's also the co-founder and CEO of the Dental Success Network, a vibrant community of dentists from around the globe focused on maximizing access of advanced clinical and practice management education to the profession. Dr. Costas is an international and number one Amazon bestseller of his book, Pillars of Dental Success. His internet radio show, The Dentalpreneur Podcast, now has a listenership from over 150 countries worldwide. Mark and his wife, Leslie, have three sons, Bryce, Brendan, and Brady, two dogs, Bear and Hazel making their home abode in Prescott, Arizona. Glad Holy to have cow. you. Thank you. That was a mouthful. Thanks, well, buddy. Yeah, but it's, it, it's, it's, it speaks truth. You know, I, I, I don't remember exactly what year it was, uh, but we crossed paths, this is well over a decade ago, you know, in, in a meeting. And I remember at that, that time, I didn't know you well, but um, I, I always knew you as being very vibrant and energetic, as you always have been. And yeah, I think at that point, you were uh, still very much in focus on the uh, Horizon Dental Assisting School. I mean, that was that was one of your platforms that was early on as you mm -hmm. it, as you graduated school. You jumped onto that pretty quickly. I mean, within was it within a year or so of you starting practice? I think it was five years into my practice journey when I had several dental practices that I couldn't find good assistance yeah. for. So I decided that I would start teaching them uh, teaching them in my own in my own kind of uh, waiting room. And that, that spun off into the Horizon Schools of Dental Assisting. Then we kind of exploded into 200 locations of that. Um, just, just, I, kind, just, just kind of exploded. Yeah. Kind, kind <laughs> but, of. <laughs> but a novice entrepreneur, right? I didn't set it up right. I, it was a one and done kind of model. You, you paid me one time. I mm -hmm. gave you the curriculum. Yeah. We licensed it to you. No annual recurring anything. And and once those 200 locations were sold, I didn't really have much more to sell. So uh, when I was getting up on stages talking about that opportunity, I would tell people kind of about my, my history in dentistry, the fact that I had several dental practices and it was very difficult at one point. I had nearly kind of a, a, a physical and emotional breakdown because I was working myself so hard, didn't structure things correctly. I didn't have an executive team. I didn't have anything like systems or anything like that sold a handful of those practices, used the two remaining practices as my lab to, to try to do it the right way. 
and then started teaching people about um, multiple practice ownership and setting your practice up the right way, leadership, you know, uh, profitability, um, uh, culture, systemization, those sorts of things. Yeah. Well, as a true entrepreneur, as you said in the bio, we learn from our mistakes. And so not being afraid, not being fearful of stepping out and trying something. And of course, it never is going to be done to the level that you could do it, you know, five years, 10 years down the road. Uh, you start with a model, you try, you set with, start with something. And it has some, some level of success, as your assisting school certainly did. Uh, mm -hmm. But you didn't let that stop you. That was just a stepping stone to going next. And your, your transparency, I think, is the key to, in my opinion, to, to who you are and how you lead as a leader. <clears throat> because too many people like to talk about you know all their successes in life and certainly that's great and fine but we know that nobody got to wherever they are wherever they are today however they define their level of success without going through you know many missteps and i think the fact that you're open about about what you learned along the way and those lessons those key lessons are something that that sows back into everybody because we've all been there if we're not there right now in some form or fashion dealing with something that we thought was going to be this and it's it's there's it's like it's like the gears are grinding right now it's not not, not fluid like we thought it would be yeah I, I totally agree with you man i i think that in life in general if you feel any arrogance or cockiness about your standing in life your your rooms that you're hanging out in are way too small Right. I mean, I, I don't go a day without feeling small and inadequate. Right. And I think that 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 pressure that we put on ourselves as entrepreneurs and humans is really, really important to to personal development and growth. Right. If you're not doing things that humble you, it's funny when I go to the gym and I'm feeling good about my bench press or my ability to run an X minute mile or whatever. It does. It, it doesn't take long before somebody else walks into the gym and, and right. humbles me like immediately, like a 14 year old kid can humble me in the gym. Uh, and if, if that's not happening to you on a regular basis, then you're not hanging out in big enough rooms. You're not surrounding yourself with people that challenge you and question, um, uh, question your tactics, strategies, the way that you're living your life. I think it's really, really important to get around the right people. Yeah. And there's, I think a certain pressure that's put on a lot of entrepreneurs that, that have the DNA of being drivers and, and, you know, again, being successful through the, uh, the machinations of going through curriculum in school, just, you know, getting the grades and, you know, graduating into the high school and the, the college and, you know, professional school. And, and, and there's certain um, expectations I think that are put upon us that say, you've, you've got to always be the mark. You've always got to look the part. You've got to look successful. You can't ever let your guard down and ever let somebody see inside and say, there's actually areas of my life or experiences that I've had or things I've tried that didn't work. Oh no, I don't want to expose those. And that's the worst thing. So creating an environment with, with, as a leader, which is what you do well, is you say, hey, we're, we're all here to learn together. We all are learning lessons. And, and you just put the uh, the processes, the systems, as you said, cultural leadership in place that many who, who want to walk that path and, and become better at what they do in all respects, you've got the platform there at, at DSI. Yeah. Well, thank you. I mean, th let's think about any, any arc of a hero arc, right? Let's think about Rocky. If Rocky in the movie Rocky, which is what 1970 and Sylvester Stallone's first stab at writing a movie and, and starring in a movie, won an Oscar for it. But think about that movie as he was writing it if Rocky was um, Apollo Creed from the very beginning and he, he never lost a match and his life was flawless, his relationships were perfect, he was rich from the get-go, that's not a very interesting story. I mean, that's not a movie that I would want to watch and he, right. that definitely wouldn't win an Oscar. I mean, it's all about the journey. It's all about the setbacks. It's all about the struggles and, and you know, taking a hard look in the mirror and saying, uh, this is a gut check time. This is a trajectory moment. I can go one way or the other. Those are, those are what makes the richness of life. And I think that that's what develops us as humans. So Mark, through all of the experiences and trials, tests, wins, losses, setbacks, whatever, the iterations you've gone through in your own personal development, how do you define success today? Well, that's a great question. And I've had many, you know, uh, I've had learning disability and it was very difficult for me to get into dental school. You and I have talked about this before mm -hmm. three years and 21 tries to get into dental school. That trajectory event led me to owning my own business and, and, and 
uh, enrolling in the executive MBA program, which was a trajectory moment. And it was also during that period of time that I met my wife. And if I would have gotten right into dental school, I never would have met her. I never would have the three, the three awesome boys that I have right now. If my first six dental practices were wildly successful and I, I didn't run into a brick wall of, of physical exhaustion and um, near emotional breakdown, uh, by not structuring things correctly, then I never would have scaled to 16 practices afterwards. Uh, there, there's just a number of different things where the failures left to uh, led to eventual successes and eventual breakthroughs. I do think that success to me, to answer your question, is constant improvement and being able to self-reflect and recognize when things need work in your own life, right? So um, I alluded to this before, uh, it's all about the people that you surround yourself with. I try to surround myself with people of the highest moral character. Um, and that wasn't always the way that, uh, that I ran my life. I, you know, if, if there's somebody that is, um, you know, harsh or difficult to be around, they're not a good boss. They're not a good leader. I don't want to be around those types of people, no matter how quote unquote successful they are to the outside world. And that is, that is a realization that I've made later in my life. So I surround myself with people of the highest moral, moral and ethical character, no matter what. That, that's like a number one rule of mine. Uh, number two, I, I, you know, as far as other areas of my life, not just relationships, but business development, I want to surround myself with people that are conscious capitalists, that are actually doing better in the world, that they have a grander vision beyond just, you know, getting another zero or comma in their bank account, surrounding myself with people like that and emulating them to the best of my ability. That, that is another uh, area that I can feel, um, uh, successful. Uh, I look at my own physical, physical vessel, right? My body, uh, the, the fuel that I put into it and the things that I refrain from putting into it, uh, the amount of, uh, the amount of, uh, movement and exercise that I get, I truly believe that this, that my body is, you know, um, uh, one and done and, uh, it was a gift of mine and I'm just going to take the best care of it that I can. And I want to see my great, great grandkids. You know, I, I, I want to be able to, to, to play with my grandkids and, and not have pain every time I get up from a chair. And then financially speaking, um, success for, for me, financially speaking, I'm already set for life. Like I, I could, I, I don't require a lot, nor does my family. We live a very simple life. I, I don't require a 10,000 square foot house or, or anything super fancy. I don't need, I don't need a Ferrari. Um, so right now, if I quit working, I'd be set for the rest of my life. As I know that a lot of your followers, uh, David, that that's one of your, your goals is to make people, you know, have enough, um, passive income that they don't have to worry about, you know, the, the, you know, the bottom layer of Maslow's hierarchy of needs anymore, I'm already set for life. So now when I'm looking at um, building my wealth, I'm looking at legacy wealth. I'm looking at a freedom number. Um, mm -hmm. And so that I could do more good in the world. Those are, those are some of the areas where I feel like um, success is centered around for me. Let's, let's key back on associations of uh, the people you surround yourself with, which I agree hundred percent. That's, that's one of the, the pillars I would say to success. How early did you adopt that philosophy? In other words, when you were going through some of your early entrepreneurial pursuits uh, with the um, Horizon Dental Assisting School or your initial half a dozen practices and, you know, hitting, hitting some of those challenges, the roadblocks, the brick wall, uh, had, had you had an opportunity to set yourself up with a few key people, a mentor? Uh, what did that look like for you in those early years? Yeah, that's such a great question because I know that you and I have some similar kind of um, uh, mentors that we've leaned on. So like back in the day when, um, there were no such thing as like business coaches, particularly nobody that I could look to in the dental realm. I looked outside of the dental realm and there's, there's certain marketers and certain business people that you and I have in common way back in the day that were influencers before there was a, a word influencer. Right. right. Uh, so there's only a handful that, that I had to choose from. There was no YouTube videos. There was no, no podcasts. It was like literally ordering CDs from a, 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 from a person who wrote a book that resonated with you. Mm -hmm. Right. So back in the day, it was very, very rudimentary as far as the people that we could look to. There was like, you know, the one life coach was Tony Robbins and the right. one marketing coach was Dan Kennedy and, and Bill Glazer. And and, uh, you know, the one uh, uh, Internet coach was like a Frank Kern. 
So those are the people that we looked to and emulated and got as much information from that as we could. Nowadays, it's at our fingertips. We have the ability to not only follow the people that we want to follow and, and um, have dozens of mentors that we've met or not met before, but we have the ability to influence other people as well by building those groups ourselves. So it, it has definitely evolved. And the, the groups of people that I've surrounded myself with um, and now it's very, very easy to connect with people all over the country. I, I often like marvel how many different states and countries I have friends in now, yeah. right? So my best friends and my group that I spend the most time with, none of them even live in my hometown, right? Um, and that doesn't mean that I have to go bowling with them every Tuesday night and, and you know, have six Bud Lights. That's, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about let's talk about deep things. Let's, let's continue these personal relationships and surrounding yourself with people doesn't always have to be physical proximity. So things have evolved quite a bit. And I think, um, you know, uh, this day and age, it's, it's easier to do that than ever. Well said, well said. Let's talk a little bit about challenges and opportunities in our industry specifically today. Uh, there, there's both. Um, <laughs> what, do you, what do you see as some of the biggest uh, headwinds that our colleagues faced face today, you, you engage with so many of them. Um, we, we've been there ourselves. What do you see today as some of the biggest challenges that, are, that they're facing and, and trying to overcome? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Uh, if you look back at the statistics, um, it wasn't that long ago when 84, 85% of dental practice, uh, of dentists were practice owners. Um, that's dropped all the way down to the mid 70s. Um, and if you compare that with physicians, uh, physicians own about 47, 49% of physicians own their own practices. Um, it appears to me that we're going in that direction of consolidation and, and, uh, and group practices. That's not necessarily a bad thing. I think there's some opportunity there for a lot of people, but I think that um, the, the, the hold that dental insurance companies have on the way that we practice dentistry is definitely a challenge that we have to address at some point, uh, or we're going to look up and we're going to have gone the way of medicine. And most of uh, practicing dentists will not own their own dental practices. And, you know, to some degree won't own their, their own trajectory and, and, and their, their own destiny, which, which makes me really sad. Um, another huge challenge. Uh, I'm just throwing these out here. Not that I have, you know, solid solutions for any of them, but another huge challenge is the fact that um, the, the student loan debt is just absolutely out of hand. The average student loan for, for uh, debt for um, a graduating dentist now is $280,000, but that is really low. Mm -hmm. the, the associates that work for me, all of them have over $500,000 in student loan debt, and that's, that's them living quite frugally. Um, throughout dental school and not spending any extra money because, you know, it's $100,000 plus living expenses per year for a private dental school nowadays. Um, and the fact that those dental schools are so mismanaged as, as, our, as our government is, no matter how much they charge for tuition, if those funds are mismanaged, they still have to take uh, uh, sponsorships from large DSOs. Right. And large insurance companies, I won't right. name any of them, but it's it, entire wings of new dental schools are named after a supplier or yes. a DSO or, uh, or an insurance company. And they're, they're not allowing the students to have access to people that really want to help them. I can't tell, I've spoken at over half the dental schools. A lot of the times I'm not allowed on campus. It's like, oh, geez, for, forgive me for trying to give free information about how to manage your money before and after dental right. school for free. And when I'm not even selling you anything, but they will, they will allow XYZ DSO to come in and do a lunch and learn and sponsor a wing of their school. It's just broken. It's broken. So that, that's another big challenge. And that's the future of our profession. Um, that we're allowing to be influenced by these negative forces. So I don't have the answers to these, but those are some of the big things that I see as, as problematic for our profession moving forward. So let's flip it to the other side. With all that chaos and disruption, where are the opportunities? Yeah, so dentistry for me, I still think is the best profession. I think it's the best profession. Uh, the reason that um, you know there's such a low default rate and why banks and lenders love to lend, lend to dentists is because there's a very low default rate. For private practices, 
one to two practices, the default rate is 1%. Uh, for groups, for small group practices and DSO, DSOs, the, the default rate goes all the way up to 10%, but a 10% default rate um, for a large company and, and a large amount of money is still very low. So uh, uh, lenders love to, to, to lend to dentists. And the reason that people are willing to lend to dentists, even though they have huge amount of student loan debt, is because of the value of our skill set, right? There's not a whole lot of professions out there where you can, you can prep a crown in 20 minutes and charge $900 for it. And you can do three of those in an hour, or you can place an implant and get paid $3,000 for it. There's not a lot of uh, professions out there where we can produce and charge out so much per hour of our time. So whether or not you're a sophisticated business owner and run a super tight and efficient practice, uh, we, uh, they know that there can be a lot of sloppiness in, in the way that we run a business because of the value of our skill set. So from a positive standpoint, I think that dentistry still and will be forever a great profession because there's so much value in an hour of our time and, and the skill set. Even if we're a bread and butter dentist, we have the ability to, to bill out a large amount of money per hour. Um, I still think that, you know, you look at other professions and, and me being somebody that was unable to get into dentistry for three years, I know what the other side of that looks like. I've had just about every type of job that you could possibly have. And I know that we are very, very lucky that we can, we can work six hours a day, four days a week and make four times that of the average American. So we're very, very blessed in, in that area as well. Um, and then, gosh, with the technology and the ability to, to create super GPs nowadays, all in X treatment, molar endo, um, some of the GPs out there right now, this whole generation of GPs that's growing up in this generation, um, are, are incredible with what they can do surgically, what they can keep in office without referring out. Um, it's just a whole different paradigm than it was when you and I graduated. Absolutely. I, I agree hundred percent, Mark. So as I know you do speak to a lot of dental students and young graduates mm -hmm. in, in your presentations and just, you know, your influence, trying to influence, uh, the improvement, the betterment of the, the situation at, at large. What, what, how, are you, how are you presenting them with the, the face of their options? Let's put it this way, that their options. And as you said, there's a big anchor called the student loan debt that most of them are carrying to some degree. So that, that, that inhibits some of the options, at least initially. But what, how are you painting the picture for them? There's like a, there's like a population pyramid in, in every industry, right? And as you already said, there's consolidation going on right now, which will continue. Mm -hmm. uh, it won't never eats the whole thing. There's always going to be, you know, a, a group that can remain independent or independent groups. Uh, there'll be those that are going to uh, be employees, nothing wrong with any of those, but how are you painting the picture of the choice and options and, and having them look ahead to what, how they may set their path, their course? Yeah, that's, that's an awesome, insightful question, David. I, I think that, you know, I tried to impart upon uh, this generation that, they don't have the luxury of being sloppy like our generation when it comes to business ownership, right? right. They, don't, they don't have the, the, the luxury of, of marching into a DSO without being informed about what that, what that contract actually said and what they're beholden to for the next three years. They have to go out with a base knowledge of how to read contracts or at least surround themselves with people that can help them interpret what the heck is going on in this contract that they're agreeing to. Um, they have to get out there and and not make huge missteps like so many in our generation did in business ownership. Like, okay, we have to come out with a base knowledge. If we're borrowing a million dollars, here's how we're gonna allocate that capital. Here's how we vet out a practice opportunity. Uh, here's how we decide whether or not we're gonna do a de novo practice or an acquisition. Here's how we, here's how we research demographics. Um, here's how to analyze a PL. Those are all things that I think that we took for granted in our generation that we would figure it out and we were able to figure it out and make tons of mistakes, which probably ended up being seven figure mistakes in the grand scheme of things, but we weren't saddled with a half million dollars right. in debt coming out of the gate. So understanding personal finance, understanding basic business and, and understanding what it means to be an associate versus a practice owner, those are things that they have to walk out their D4 year and their learning institution understanding. 
tell us a little bit more about uh, DSI and DSN. And like for young docs coming out, I'm assuming the, is DSN the community the best place for them to start to get engaged or are there different levels uh, in DSI if they want to ramp up and get a little bit more coaching and some of the systems and processes and all that you bring to the table? Yeah, thank you, man. Uh, DSN, I like to, to refer to it as a three-legged stool. Three, DSN is a group right now currently of 1,200 dentists. They're all, they're all licensed dentists. Nobody else is allowed inside DSN, so there isn't the noise of, of other auxiliaries, office managers, or hygienists, or, or consultants, or anything like that inside DSN. It is a community for practicing licensed dentists. So if you can imagine this three-legged stool, number, number one, we have um, between the 1,200 dentists, we have $1.4, $1.5 billion in collective revenue. So we have a lot of leverage with just about every vendor on the planet. Every vendor on the planet wants a piece of our 1,200 sure. because they're, they are very sophisticated when it comes to business and there's just a lot of us. So we get the very best deals. We're the largest buying group in all of dentistry um, and we get the most aggressive deals. That's leg one of our stool. Leg two of our stool is a collaborative and positive environment. So you and I have both bounced in and out of uh, Facebook groups where things could get potentially snarky um, uh, when when uh, people are posting, say, a clinical case and somebody says, oh, you got an open margin then, and then it devolves into this like this poop storm of people like uh, like talking really nastily to each other. There's a one strike and you're out policy inside DSN. We have several different chat rooms moderated by um, experts, um, clinical experts, practice management experts, et, et cetera. And you're only there to post, ask questions and support. There's no, there's no space for uh, criticism and just snarkiness and negativity that there's a one strike and you're out policy that we have a very, very vibrant uh, 20 room uh, community inside there. That's, that's uh, leg two of the stool. And then leg three is we have hundreds of hours of continuing education in our learning portal uh, where you can go and get continuing education uh, virtually. Uh, you could attend live events that we're hosting uh, and that's like three of the stool. So that's DSN. That's about 1200 dentists strong right now. DSI is our, um, is our elite kind of level coaching. And we work with dental practice owners to decrease the, the overhead in their practices, increase the profitability and efficiency, improve their, their culture, their leadership, and their systemization in their dental practices. That's, that's DSI. And is there um, some, some criteria that you looked at uh, when people should consider DSI? Is there a, a, a kind of a, a overall, uh, here's where you should be, or is it just an owner period that wants to, uh, to aspire to, to, to do things better in their own practice in life? Yeah, very insightful question again. Yes, we have, we have nearly reached our max inside DSI. We can only serve about 200 people and still maintain the value of a small concierge type group. So we do, we have a vetting process. We have, um, we have an interview process and you either will slide into a spot if there's one or two spots available at the time um, and can start right away or you go on a short waiting list and, and uh, if, if you're approved, you'll slide into a spot when it becomes available. So we have a very finite number of people that we will accept into that group. And the main thing that we look for is positivity and implementation. Action takers are welcome. It doesn't matter if you have a $500,000 practice or if you have a, a, a DSO that is 20 practices plus. And we have people from that first one all the way up to the second one and everything in between. What we're looking for is positivity, implementation, and just the right culture fit because we are like a family in there and we have to make sure that you're going to gel with the other people in the group. It, it, it's so important. And I know you do that well. So thanks for, for giving us that insight. Sure. Of course. I know that you have uh, your, I think co-hosting a conference, I believe in Denver uh, on the, the DSO uh, element coming yeah. up. Yeah. Do you want to just give a little blurb about that? And we can put it in, uh, in the show notes. If yeah. Thank interested. you so much. Sure. I appreciate that. Yeah. So this is, you know, we're, we're really good at working with practices to get the rudimentary structure and frameworks in place, all of the systems and, and all the processes to become what we call a black belt level practice with very, very low overhead, great leadership score, great systemization score, great cultural assessment score. That is, that is what we do. And we work with single offices all the way up to multiple practices. But when you get to a certain point, say three, four, five practices, and you're ready to scale and you, you wish to scale up to 25, 75, 100 practices, 
there are certain elements that we don't necessarily coach in our group, but um, our sister organization are, we, we've kind of uh, latched onto another organization called Polaris Healthcare Partners, and they're incredible with that. Um, uh, DeWalker and Perrin over there at uh, Polaris are really, really smart dudes when it comes to finance, fundraising, um, uh, valuations, um, you know, several different tiers of sales with private equity and venture capital. Those are the sorts of things that, that we are partnering in teaching. So we have an upcoming event. It's a DSO level event and it's called scaling from clinician to CEO. And that is going to be October 5th through the 7th in Denver, Colorado at the Marriott. You can go to polarishealthcarepartners.com and uh, find out more information about that. It's a very small event. We are not taking any more than 150 people, and we're not taking any more than three people from one any one DSO or organization. What we don't want is one DSO to sign up and bring all 15 yeah. of their associates, and that would take up a good portion exactly. of the room. So we want a, a, enough people represented there that uh, that people will be able to network and get some good uh, information from the other attendees. But thank you for allowing me to talk about that. Fantastic. Yes, sir. All right. My last question. Yes. What's next for Mark Costas? Oh gosh, there's so much. I just had a, a, a group Zoom meeting with some of my friends. We have a bunch of technology that's being developed right now. We, um, I can't let the cat out of the bag yet, but we have a lot of really, really interesting uh, pieces of technology that we're going to tack on to the DSI, DSN platform to make it available to our members, just another value add. Some of it has to do with scheduling. Some of it has to do with financing. Um, I, I don't mean to be cryptic, but several different projects happening simultaneously in parallel with several different development teams. And once those start to be um, developed and get to beta phase, we're going to try those out inside our network, and then we're going to release them to the world as a whole. But it all comes down to um, making this kind of dental practice ownership journey more seamless and and uh, less disjointed. Right now, you and I know that um, your clients and uh, maybe uh, some people that you know very well have dental offices and they're a la carting everything. Like if I look currently at my PL right now, I'm a la carting probably a dozen different SaaS products from a hundred to $400 a month. We're trying to get away from that so we can kind of consolidate that, bundle that all in one place. And severely, hugely decrease the price that yeah. people are paying for, for these types of services. So that's the next step in the next iteration of DSN. Thank you for asking. Yes, sir. Well, that's one of the huge benefits of the leverage of a strong community is, mm -hmm. is that, is that is your, as a solo doc out there, as, as we've talked about, it's, it's not impossible. It's very difficult today. Uh, we we there, there are not the margins that we had available back in the day. Certainly, back in my day, which is before your day, uh, we we were we were very sloppy uh, and had a lot of time to to learn as we go along. There's no time for that today. And whether you want to be uh, a strong solo practitioner or remain private or be with the DSO, whatever your, your level, I think you've got to be associated with some group uh, that you you believe is is like your group, your tribe. And the benefits that they bring uh, that allows you to be who you want to be, and I know that's what you do in in DSI. You know, every doc gets to be who he or she wants to be, but they get to do it in a community that gives them the benefits of of the leverage of that community. That's that's where I see uh, so much strength in what you're doing. Well, thank you, buddy. I really appreciate everything you're doing for our for our profession as well, and I love the crossover and some of the people that we have in common. Um, nobody out there has a better reputation than you do. Uh, for uh, for a high level community like you host, um, you're doing great things, buddy. Well, my my hat tip right back to you. Thanks so much for your time today. We'll uh, continue to uh, upgrade uh, what's what's happening uh, on both sides of the of the spectrum here. But uh, thank you again for for giving us some time today, Mark. Have an awesome day. Talk to you soon, David. Great. If you enjoyed watching or learning from this video, please leave a like and subscribe to my channel for more content. If you have a question about any of my content or this specific video, just please leave a comment down below. And as always, stay focused on your freedom. I'll see you next time.